Well, good morning, church. Good to see you all to worship together. If you uh, didn't get the opportunity to take advantage of the muffins for moms that you saw advertised as you came in, uh, that is still available after services. That involves muffins and moms and coffee, and, and there may be some other things, but uh, we thank the all-stars who prepared that. And I was thinking, what are we going to do for dads? Hot dogs for dads? <laughs> donuts? Donuts for dads? Some, some day we'll think about it, but uh, we do appreciate that. And feel free to go back there and enjoy a muffin. I want to begin this morning by sharing a poem. It's written all the way back in 1865 by William Ross Wallace. So the language may be a little bit uh, hard to follow at times, but both because it's poetry and because it's 158 years old, but I think you'll get it anyhow. But what really is more bothersome to me is that the, the sentiments in it and the thoughts expressed in it may seem quaint and out of date to us. And that is a problem and perhaps an explanation of a lot of the problems that we face in our culture today. The poem is entitled, What Rules the World? Blessing on the hand of woman. Angels guard her strength and grace in the cottage, palace, hovel. Oh, no matter where the place. Wood that never storms assailed it, rainbows ever gently curled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Infancy's the tender fountain, power may with beauty flow. Mothers first to guide the streamlet from them souls unresting grow. Growing on for good or evil, Sunshine streamed, or darkness hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Women, how divine your mission, here upon our natal sod. Keep, O oh, keep, the young heart open, always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, fathers, sons, and daughters cry, and the sacred song is mingled with the worship of the sky. Mingled where no tempest darkens, rainbows evermore are curled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Let's pray. Loving God, Holy Father, we bow in your presence, grateful for this beautiful day. Beautiful not only because of the weather, but just it's your day, and we have the beauty of this fellowship. We have this extra day where we give honor to whom honor is due. Our mothers, we pray your blessing on them. And we thank you for the great gift you've given us in good mothers. Help us to learn today how your son honored mothers. And thank you for your love, we pray in Christ. Amen. So Matthew and Mark and Luke all tell us a story in their Gospels about a day when Jesus healed a mother. The differences in detail between the three accounts are, are pretty minor, but I want to use Luke's account of this story for our reading of it today. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. And when we open to the gospel, according to Luke, we find our Lord uh, in this chapter really at the beginning of his public ministry. He's come through the temptation in the wilderness by the devil, that's in verses 1 through 13 of Luke 4. 
He's come to Galilee, Luke writes, in the power of the Spirit to begin his public work. It's verse 14. He's also been rejected in his hometown of Nazareth when he went to the synagogue there and rejected with violence. That's verse 30. Then came to another town in Galilee, Capernaum, and he went also to the synagogue there. And while there, he confronts and rebukes a demon that had possessed a man and just amazed everybody with the power of his word. That's in verses 31 through 37. So that brings us to the story I want us to look at in verses 38 through 41 of Luke 4. Let's read that together as we think about these things. Luke chapter 4, verse 38 says, And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever there. They appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of some, of many, and they cried, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. Well, the Simon that's mentioned in this text, of course, is better known to us as Peter, one of the apostles. So we learned some interesting things about Peter here and also about the mother uh, in the story. Um, and then most importantly, we learn some important things about Jesus here. First, of Peter, we learn that Peter had a wife. He was married. How do we know that? Because he had a mother-in-law. And, you know, it's pretty hard to have that without a wife. And it sort of comes with the territory. So Peter is married. Um, that's not our only evidence about Peter's marital status. If you go over, for, for example, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, Paul, the writer there, he alludes to this. Uh, Paul, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 5 writes the following. He says, Do we not have the right to take, take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Well, Cephas is yet a third name that Peter is known by. And so Paul affirms that Peter had a wife. Also in 1 Peter 5 and verse 1, where Peter is writing, he refers to himself as an elder in the church. And we know that an elder is to be the husband of one wife. Uh, we know that from 1, Peter, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2. So it's pretty clear that Peter was a married man. He had a wife, and to go along with that, he had a mother-in-law whom he cared for obviously, as we read in this story in Luke 4. As I said earlier, the story we read in Luke 4 is also told in Matthew. It's in Matthew chapter 8 there, if you want to read that account. It's also told in Mark in chapter 1. I chose Luke for us in part because he gives some extra detail. In fact, it's an extra medical detail. Uh, both Matthew and Mark tell us that Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. Luke, who you might remember, is a physician by trade, according to Colossians 4, verse 14, where he's called the beloved physician. He says that she was suffering from a high fever, not just what we might call a, a little bug, but she was really very sick. 
perhaps something like ma malaria or, or, or some illness like that, very common in that world. Ancient medical practitioners like Luke classified fevers in little and big, uh, small and great. And this was a great fever, very dangerous. I would guess that, that this was the kind of illness that most people did not survive in the first century. I mean, how could they? That there was really no viable treatment at that time. A lot of different efforts, we might call them superstitious efforts, but nothing with any healing value. So this was a, an emergency. And that was why Simon Peter and his brother Andrew and, and also James and John we learn from the other accounts, all came to Jesus. They all urgently begged Jesus to come and tend to this woman. They had faith from experience that Jesus could do something about this emergency. And of course, they were exactly right about that. So Jesus comes to her. Luke says that he stood over her. No doubt she is in bed with this illness. The other writers uh, mentioned that Jesus touched or took her hand. And, and Jesus, just like he did in the synagogue with the demon, rebuked the fever in her. And the text says it instantly left her. This is the only time I'm aware of where anyone speaks to an illness. Uh, can you imagine the scene, speaking words of rebuke, not to a person, not even to a, a demon in a person, but to, to a disease. Speaking words of power to a disease and it leaves instantly. It is gone. But such is the power of the words of the Lord of life. And then the response of this woman this mother, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, is so striking. What does it say she does? Immediately, underline that word in the text, immediately, at once, she got up and began to serve them. As if nothing had happened. As if there had been no illness. Now, I'm sure we've all had fevers, maybe even some high ones. You know what it's like after a fever breaks. There's a great relief. You feel better. But you certainly don't feel like immediately getting up and doing anything. You, you have sort of this, don't know what the medical term is, I'll, I'll call it fever fatigue that you have to recover from. But not when Jesus takes care of your fever. Not when Jesus rebukes your illness. No, when Jesus heals you, it's gone. And there are no leftovers. There are no side effects. Jesus rebukes a demon and it runs off screaming. Jesus rebukes a storm on the sea and it tucks its tail between its legs like a scorned dog and the sea is calm as glass. Jesus rebukes a fever and you are as good as new instantly, immediately. Now you compare that to the so-called spiritual healers today and see what you get. So the hero of the story is definitely Jesus. His power is the story. But to me, there's, there's certainly something lovely about this mother that Jesus healed. Even if the illness was gone, in the blink of an eye, she never hesitated. She never delayed. She didn't sit around in shock or, or, or sort of going on about what happened. 
what does the text say she did? She got right up and she began to serve them. She began to serve. That is special. And that is worthy, I think, of our attention for a moment or two this morning. It tells us something about her, and I think it tells us something about good mothers in general. How many of you had or have a mom who served you whether she felt good or not? Oh, come on. I know you did. I, I certainly did. It's what good mothers are about. You know the word used here when it says she began to serve them in the verse here? It's the same word that is used to describe church deacons. Isn't that interesting? Uh, she got up from her sick bed and she deaconed them, you might say. She served them. She took care of them. She waited on them. She provided for them. Now, I know that we have in, in the assembly today several deacons in the Lord's Church here and perhaps several potential deacons. And you know, if we were studying about th that this morning, we could go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and we could study the requirements or the qualifications of a deacon in the church of our Lord. But I'll tell you guys, if you just have the spirit of this good mother in Luke 4, you'd be just fine. If you remember what your mama was like, whether she was sick or healthy, tired or refreshed, young or old, busy or had all the time in the world, she served. She served. And she didn't have to be asked. She didn't have to be pled with or bargained with or cajoled. She just got up and she served. Do we have that spirit today, guys? Uh, is that how we are? Is that how you are? And if not, why not? What has changed? Has Jesus not taken your hand and healed you of sin? Why would you not then rise up and serve? What a special mother this was. How she teaches us today. She being dead, yet speaks. One of the great things about this particular gospel, the gospel of Luke, is the many women that he tells us about who served, and who served in particular, Jesus. Uh, this lady in Luke 4, then if you go over to uh, chapter 8 of Luke, verses 2 and 3, he mentions Mary Magdalene, he mentions a woman named Joanna, and he mentions another one named Susanna, and then he says many others who served Jesus and, and supported the 12, and he says even financially. <coughs> Remember, these guys had left their professions to follow Jesus. How did they support themselves? It seems like there were women who financially supported Jesus and the, and the 12. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, we learn from Luke about Mary and Martha. Um, they were sisters of Lazarus. And uh, we see wonderful qualities there. And then, of course, most touchingly at the cross, when nearly all the men had abandoned the Lord and, and run off in fear and found a locked door someplace, the women remained. Luke chapter 23, verse 49 and 55. And one of the great things about Mother's Day 
is that it forces us guys to stop a moment and take notice and to give honor to whom honor is due. I think one of the great texts of scripture that we would benefit from maybe reading in our quiet time today is Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31, sometimes called the worthy woman passage. I just want to quote a couple pieces from that as we wrap up this morning. It says she is far more precious than jewels. She rises while it is yet night and provides for her household. She dresses herself with strength. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And so today I hope this story of the day Jesus healed a mother has made an impression on you. And uh, if Jesus has healed you of sin, that you will follow this example and, and get up and get to serving others. And if you've never invited Jesus in yet, he indeed stands at the door and knocks, just awaiting your welcome. And he brings with him full healing power for anything that you're in need of. If you need to respond in some way this morning, we give you the next few moments to let us know publicly. Let us stand. Let us sing.